right, thank you very much, worship team. And good morning, everybody. A special happy Mother's Day to, uh, to all the mothers here in the church service today and for those of you who are online as well. I'm uh, grateful for you and grateful for your special day today. I want to share several announcements with you uh, this morning. Uh, the first couple of ones are just meetings to remind you of. Um, administration committee uh, tomorrow night um, at 8 o'clock. Um, here's what the city kid learned that 8 o'clock is in spring and summer is when the meeting's going to take place because of farm work that needs to be done. I learned that from Scott, so this is, this is good. Um, also, we have a couple of circle meetings, come, a circle meeting coming up on, uh, on Tuesday. The Women's Association is meeting. Vision Team is meeting on Tuesday as well. Uh, we also have on Thursday the Worship Committee and, uh, and a reminder for all staff. We have an all staff meeting with food. Um, taking place at 5 o'clock on, uh, on Thursday as well. Uh, also a reminder, too, next Saturday of the Youth Spaghetti Dinner. Uh, details on the uh, insert that's uh, inside your bulletin as well. Uh, so please note that, too. Uh, please also note the details about the Memorial Day celebration coming up. Yes, we're well into May now, so this is, this is perfect to do that, too. And uh, also a reminder, uh, and please read all the details about this, about the uh, Just One presentation uh, coming up on, uh, from 12 until 1 on May the 22nd. Uh, this is a, uh, a part of a vision, minist vision ministries of Lawrence County, and it's an outreach to educate people on the dangers of fentanyl and fentanyl-laced drugs in our community. Um, so, so please note that as well. Are there any other announcements for the good of the body today? Yes, so here we go. Where, where, whereabouts? Oh, there we are, Steve, yes. Thank you, sir. Thanks for getting my attention. I just want to make a quick reminder to guys, next Saturday, I know it's a busy time of year, but we do have Bible study uh, next Saturday morning. And I'm not sure Harry and I are probably going to cook something. It might even be outside. So uh, last month we had 18 guys there. So uh, it's a wonderful group. So if you want, please join us next Saturday morning for men's Bible study. And, and they are good cooks, too. I will testify to that. Absolutely. Well, let us... Uh, begin our worship this morning by standing for the call to worship that is found um, in your bulletin and also on the screens. We adapt this this morning from Psalm 121, and it really provides the theme for today. Let's say this together. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my hope come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You watch over me, Lord, and you do not slumber. He who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. You have been and will always be, Lord God, my hope for today and forevermore. Praise to you, Lord. Let us worship God. I see the lost, I see the least, I see the always there. 
solace from this spring. And he who lives to be my king, once died to be my savior.
Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us, kneeling on this battleground, see just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Skies and preach. <laughs> That'll preach. Please be seated. As we come to our Lord in a time of prayer today, let us pray. That really says it all, Lord God. Um, really says it all, that, uh, that you never leave us alone. We'll learn about more in the message today, that you are faithful to us in all the circumstances of our lives. And so for that, Lord, and for many other reasons, we come, first of all, to praise you today. Lord, we praise you for your love, which we really sang about this morning, through Jesus. Lord, the power, Lord, to, to, to be with us, Lord, to gather us, as it says in the scripture, as a mother hen gathers her chicks. Lord God, we praise you for your father's power, and also, Lord, for the mother's love that you demonstrate as well. We praise you for your providence, Lord, keeping this world turning as we see the buds pop into leaves this May. We, Lord, have evidence of that all around us. As Josh McDowell once wrote in the book, evidence that demands a verdict. And Lord, we praise you today on this Mother's Day for mothers, Lord, for their love and for the influence they have, for the confidence, Lord, that they are capable of providing in each and every one of us. And we give you thanks today, Lord, for your mercy. You did not leave us wallowing in sin, or as we're going to talk about today, did not leave us wallowing in hopelessness either, but have intervened in our lives, especially coming down to earth, Jesus, to save us, and continuing to do so through the power of your Holy Spirit and through people you inspire to come alongside of us and to help us. We thank you, Lord, for your word, which truly is, as it says in Psalm 119, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so, Lord, now we reflect upon this past week or these past couple of weeks. And we want to spend just a couple of moments now in silence lifting personal thanksgivings to you.
Lord God, we confess today. We confess, Lord, from this past week, too, knowing we can come directly to you. We don't have to go through some priest. Lord, we can come right to you and confess to you, Lord, actions taken that were not of you, words said that were not of you, thoughts that we had that led us into sin. And so hear now, Lord, our personal and private confessions lifted up to you. Thank you, Lord, after we confess those things for the blessed assurance that we have that you are ours, Lord Jesus, and because of that, our sins have been forgiven. And thanks to the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, you are transforming us day by day through the process called sanctification to be more like you. And today we pray. We're giving you praise and thanks this morning and this Mother's Day. But Lord, today, now we want to pray because we know that this can be a difficult day for some. Lord, for mothers who are estranged from their children, I pray, Lord, for their comfort. For mothers, Lord, in this church family who have lost children to death, Lord, yes, knowing that they're in heaven, but still grieving, Lord, and this being one of those days that triggers that, I pray for comfort, Lord, for them. Lord, for those also in this church family who've lost mothers in this past year due to death. Again, knowing where their mother is in heaven, but still grieving, I pray, Lord, for their comforts. Lord, we pray for dear Pam Maloney, um, who has been diagnosed with COVID, and uh, Lord has reported this morning, uh, does have a fever with this. We pray, Lord, for her healing. Lord, we pray for um, for. Lori McHugh, Lord, who is recovering from thyroid surgery. For Joyce Schaefer, so glad she's in church today as she continues to recover from thyroid surgery with a prayer, Lord, that the nerve damage to her vocal cords would be repaired. Lord, we pray today in this community for the family of Ryan Porter, the young man who shot himself at Lowellville High School this past week. We pray, Lord, for his family who must be devastated by all of this. We don't know where their relationship is with you, Lord, but, but we know that you reach out to people no matter their relationship with you. And so we pray that you'll reach out to them. We pray, Lord, for all the students who were affected by this, thinking of Ethan and Brandon specifically, who were in the cafeteria when this happened. And Lord, we pray for the families of the students as well as they all, and the teachers, Lord, and the, and the principal of the school. The community, Lord, of Lowellville, as they all deal with this, Lord, shine your lights upon that community in this darkened time. We pray, Lord, for Barbara Carr's mom, uh, Lorna, who has a UTI and pain in her leg and has been unable to walk, Lord. We pray for her healing. We pray for Brenda Hostetler's uncle, um, Louis, Lord, who is, was hospitalized in an ambulance. We don't know his condition, Lord, but we pray for his healing. We pray, Lord, for an end to the war in Ukraine and for the defeat of the aggressor, in this case, Russia. And Lord, those are the prayers that come to our hearts and minds here, but there are many more that people brought to church with them today. And so, Lord, we know that you do, but we ask now that you would hear our prayers, personal prayers, lifted silently to you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing each and every one of those prayers. As we pray them, 
remembering the words that your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, it was in the dark days of World War II that uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill of Great Britain gave a speech to the Harrow School, located, I guess, somewhere uh, near the London area. This was the time before the U.S. had entered the war. It was 1941, but before December 7th, 1941. So at this time, Great Britain was standing alone against the Nazis. And so Winston Churchill gave this speech to the school, and towards the end of his speech, he, he said this, and I quote directly, Never give in. Never give in. Never, 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 never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty. Never give in, except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force, never yield to apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Winston Churchill was talking really about hope, and that is going to be the focus of the second message in our sermon series that we're doing called Back to the Future. The idea behind this is that the uh, Israelites, as they returned to the promised land, and as we learned last week, began to rebuild the temple, paused, and then started to rebuild the temple again, they needed to look to the future promises that God had made to them. They needed to go back to those promises once again. Translated to you and to me, we learned that, that we need to, no matter what we're dealing with in life, we need to go back to the future hope that we have in Jesus. Now, one of the things that was fascinating we found out about this, this uh, book of Haggai that we're focusing in on in this sermon series is that because of archaeological evidence and some astrological indications uh, within the archaeological evidence, we can precisely date by our calendar when each of the four prophecies that make up the book of Haggai uh, took place. Um, for example, last week we talked about the, the first prophecy. Chapter 1 is where we focused on last week. Uh, that was on August the 29th, 520 B.C. Today, as I ask you now to, to open your pew Bibles or the Bibles you brought with you or your devices or, or just take the message notes or get ready to watch the screen, uh, know that the date for this prophecy is October the 19th, 520 B.C. And so here is the word of the Lord given to the prophet Haggai. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory, meaning the temple? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desired of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. All wealth, in other words, is his, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. God's word, let's see how it translates to you and to me. And let's pray. And so that's what we're asking for today, Lord, for, for you to translate this to, to our time today. That, Lord, you'd speak to hearts, especially who are feeling hopeless today. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Winston Churchill wanted the World War II uh, 
people of Great Britain to, to, to not give up, to never give in, to, to have hope. Today, I suspect that there's some here today, and I know, you know many in our community, in our nation, who are feeling a little bit hopeless. You know, you, uh, you read about the war in Ukraine that we prayed about, and you think about the fact that there's predict predictions of food shortages as a result of that. Um, runaway inflation people are worried about with, uh, with gas prices continuing to rise. Uh, you have the decline, as we've talked about many times from this pulpit, of godly values in our nation. And you see how it plays itself out, like this past week, in which for the first time in the history of the United States, a law clerk leaked a draft of a Supreme Court decision before it was actually published, before it's actually going to be completed in June, causing a whole bunch of chaos throughout the, the country. And then close to home, you see the the tragedy that took place in Louisville High School, uh, sitting in the epic uh, luncheon with uh, the Harrises and, and listening to Ethan and Brandon share what no child should ever have to, whatever, no teen should ever have to witness and experience. And it can give people this sense of hopelessness. But this message is about hope because that's the message that God gave to the Israelites when they were feeling hopeless. And so today we want you to take a look at four approaches contained in Haggai chapter 2 verses 1 through 9. Four approaches to have, no matter what, hope for the future. The first approach for your message notes is this, to, to know the factors that can cause you to lose hope, because there are several. Really, there are several factors that caused Israel to lose hope, but it's all contained in this one verse describing the state of what Israel is thinking about. It's verse 3. Uh, as God says to them through Haggai, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem like, like nothing? There were Israelites who still were alive at this particular point who remembered the former temple before the exile to Babylon, the, the glorious former temple that, that they had. And they saw, they've seen the foundations being laid for this, this new temple. And they can see already it's not going to be anything like the first temple that they had. As a matter of fact, it caused an extreme emotional response amongst the Israelites. It's recorded for us actually in Ezra chapter 3, uh, dated around the same time frame. It says, but many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. And so from that, we actually see a number of factors that cause them to lose hope and can cause you and I to lose hope. Uh, when you reflect too much on past glories, for your notes, when you reflect too much on past glories is one of the ways you can lose hope. Israel saw that this, this new temple was going to be nothing like the old one, and so they were losing some hope. And you know, it's interesting because I said the, the first prophecy we looked at last week was August the 29th. They've only been rebuilding the temple, started rebuilding again for a month and a half, and already they're losing hope. It reminded me actually of, of uh, when my brother was, was little, uh, my brother Larry, who's now 60 years old, and I can't believe it. But, uh, but when, he was, when he was younger, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, he was one heck of a hockey player. I mean, my goodness gracious, I remember him taking a puck behind his net and going through the entire opposing team, the entire team, skating through them all, kind of like Connor McDavid and scoring a goal. There were many of us who thought he was NHL bound, but over time, uh, the skills of the other kids his age increased and his did not continue to increase. So they kind of caught up to him. Now, in his adult years, my brother could have lost a lot of hope because of the fact that, uh, that his glorious future of being an NHL player was kind of snuffed out. Thankfully, that's not the case with him. He's very happy to be a grandpa to, to many children today, and, uh, and I love to see the smile on his face when he's, uh, when he's around those kids. It's really great. But one of those things that can cause you to lose hope is when you reflect upon past glories. Part of the challenge we have in life always is, to, is this constant need to look back instead of moving forward, moving forward in our lives. But from this as well, from this, this same verse 3, we also get another factor here, which is when you experience a triggering event, 
Now, that's one of the words you hear bandied around a lot today, a triggering event. But uh, it's interesting that the Bible scholars actually saw this too when they looked at verse 3. And it really goes back to the, to the date of which this prophecy takes place. Uh, Lee and Don and I talked about it in the staff meeting a couple of weeks ago, uh, that this was October the 19th, 520 B.C. It was the Feast of the Tabernacles. Now, the Feast of the Tabernacles was there, as we're going to talk about in just a couple of minutes, to, to remember how God provided for Israel all during their, all during their wilderness wanderings. As a matter of fact, during the Feast of Tabernacles, and the reason why it was called Tabernacles is that Israel left their homes for those eight days, and they actually lived in tents or tabernacles to remind themselves of that's how their ancestors lived when they were wandering through the Promised Land. But here's the thing. The Feast of the Tabernacles, for hundreds of years, took place next to this glorious temple that God had Solomon build. And so when they celebrated the Feast of the Tabernacles in 520 B.C. amongst this partially reconstructed temple, it triggered them. It triggered them to sadness. It triggered them to grief, which can happen to you and me as well. You hear a song on the radio. It reminds you of somebody you lost who was close to you, and you go right back there. Or you see a TV show or a commercial, and it reminds you of a job that you had that that ended ingloriously, and you go right back there again. One of the factors you need to realize is that, is that sometimes events can happen that trigger things for you. But here's something else also kind of fleshed out from verse 3. When you're not realistic about current conditions, that can also cause you to, re- to lose hope. So, so Israel's bemoaning the fact that this temple isn't as great. But think about when the first temple was built. I mean, my goodness, the The Israelites were a vast nation at that point. Solomon was king over everything. People were bringing bringing tribute to him all the time. Uh, They had peace on all sides, no wars. No wonder they had the the wealth and the people, the manpower, everything else to, to build this first temple. Now it's 520 B.C., 42,000 Israelites have come back from Babylon. The rest have remained. The only income they're really getting is from the generosity of of King Darius of the Persian Empire and whatever they can collect from 42,000 people compared to millions before who were there. It was not realistic for them to think that, that this temple would be as good. We can have the same sense in our own lives of, of, of unrealism, if you want to call it that. Um, I thought about major league baseball when I thought about this, actually, that, um, that, you know, and by the way, I boycotted Major League Baseball until there is a salary cap, but, but uh, you know, there are many diehard baseball fans out there, maybe amongst you, Pirates fans who say, you know, this is our year. Uh, we're we're going to get the, to the World Series this year. But I have to tell you, realistically speaking, they ain't going nowhere with a $40 million payroll. It's just it's not going to happen. We need to be realistic in our expectations, realistic based on current conditions. Into all of this, though, John Calvin actually has something to say about this in his commentary on his pa- this passage. He thinks that behind all of this, behind reflecting upon past glories, behind triggering events, behind not being realistic, is Satan working at you. That's what he talked about, was the evil one was working on the Israelites to try and discourage them. He does the same thing to you. Why even try to get that promotion after you failed so miserably in your last job? Is what Satan might say to you. You know, why even try to move forward in your faith after that horrible mistake you made many years ago? It's the way he tries to discourage you. It's the way he tries to discourage me. So when you're aware of those factors that can cause you to lose hope, it can actually focus you on where you need to focus, which is on this second approach, The second approach is this. No, you can, you can be strong because as the worship team sang many times this morning in their songs, God is with you. He is with you and he's never ever going to let you go. One of the things I've learned over the years as I've you know, learned how to, to interpret passages in, in seminary and to apply it to our lives is you always look for repetition. We talk about this in staff meeting a lot too. Um, Ashley joined us last week. 
uh, for staff meeting as well. And you look, when you're looking at a Bible verse for times that things are repeated, because God is trying to emphasize when he repeats something. So in verse 4a, he repeats a verb and an adverb three times. Look at that verse. He says, but now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. Would you say, okay, that's fine. He's telling them they can be strong. But that's Israel in 520 BC. It does not apply to me. Well, what you have to also do is you have to look at the number of times God says the same thing throughout biblical history. And he does over and over and over again. For example, Joshua chapter 1, when Joshua is getting ready to cross into the promised land, it says this, Be strong and courageous, God says to him. You will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Or King Asa of Israel, when enemies were bearing down on him. Second Chronicles chapter 15, But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Daniel, the prophet Daniel, during the exile, the time in Israel was in Babylon. God speaks to him in Daniel chapter 10 and says, Do not be afraid, O man highly esteemed. He said, Peace, be strong now, be strong. And then finally, Ephesians chapter 6, in which Paul is speaking now to Gentiles, to, to you and to me. He says this to the Ephesian church. He says, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So how can we be when you face the circumstances of life? How can we be strong? Because, as Haggai is inspired to say in verse 4b, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. And he says this throughout biblical history as well. He said it to Moses. He said it to Joshua. Jesus said it before he ascended into heaven. Matthew chapter 28, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age, he says always till the very end of the age. God is with you, and God is going to complete the, the plan that he has to play out in this world. It's going to, he's going to complete it for the Israelites. He's going to complete it for you and me. He's going to complete it for, for the world. He's going to complete it for the nations. He's going to complete it for this region, for this county, for these two states, Ohio and Pennsylvania, and in your life as well. He's going to complete that plan. The plan was launched back in the time of Abraham, but really came into prominence during the exodus from, from Egypt when it says here in, in verse 5, Haggai reminds, God reminds through Haggai of them, this is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. Part of that plan was Israel was going to be this glorious shining light. And from that glorious shining light, Gentiles, uh, you and me, were going to come to seek God and find God, and know God, and become part of the kingdom of God. That's what's meant here in verse 7b when it says, the desired of all nations will come. It's pointing forward to that time when, when Jesus walks the earth, uh, to that time when the apostles in the book of Acts reach out to, to, to Gentiles like you and to me and bring them to faith. It points forward to our time when we build relationships with people who don't know Jesus, when we share our faith, and when they come to faith in Jesus. It points forward to all of that. The idea of, of God being with you is one that Jonathan Rumi, the actor, learned. Uh, Jonathan Rumi, uh, a few years ago, was actually kind of out of work, um, had a few jobs here and there, a few acting jobs here and there, but really was struggling financially to the point where he had no money in his bank account and $20 in his pocket. And he didn't know what he was going to do. Um, as I read in the story recounting his testimony, he's a Christian, Jonathan Rumi is, uh, he, he said that up until that point, he'd always kind of live by the adage that, that God helps those who help themselves. But he was at the end of his rope. And so he got down on his knees and he simply prayed, I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. And then he went out with his 20 bucks to get himself a sandwich. And when he came back, he checked his mailbox. And inside the mailbox were four checks from acting jobs he had done that kept him going. And three months later, he received a call from a, from a film producer and writer he'd never heard of named Dallas Jenkins, who said, I want to cast you in my TV series. 
And as that TV series now begins its third season of filming, Jonathan Rumi, the broke out of work actor, is known the world over in the series The Chosen for his portrayal of Jesus, influencing many, many more people along the way. God is with you too. He's with you as on Mother's Day, you as a, as a mother, uh, struggle in raising your children or, or struggle dealing with your, your adult children. He's with you as you try and finish your education or try to get yourself established in your new home. He, he's with you as, you as you expand your career, as you try to expand your business. He's with you as you prepare for retirement. He's with you in all of those circumstances. And knowing that he's with you can also help you with the third approach described in these passages for having hope for your future. The third approach is this. Note his past provision when your world is shaken. Note his past provision when your world is shaken. This community was shaken this past week by that shooting that took place in Louisville High School. You have to look back in those from at times like this and look back at the times that God has been with this community and, uh, and has always been with this community. I love what uh, Jonathan Rumi said when he received those letters. You know, as a Christian, he believed the Holy Spirit was with him. And verse 5b says here that uh, my spirit remains among you, is what he said to the Israelites. In a general sense, the Holy Spirit was, was with the Israelites, you know, kind of uh, on the periphery, guiding and directing, using prophets. With us now, because of Jesus' resurrection and ascension to heaven, the Holy Spirit now pours into us directly, is with us directly as believers in Jesus, and can guide and direct our steps, and will provide for us all along the way. The Feast of the Tabernacles, again, as I mentioned, uh, that took place there on October 19th, uh, 520 B.C., that was all about celebrating God's provision, how God provided manna, those... Uh, those, those weird flakes that looked like uh, coriander seed and tasted like wafers mixed with honey, it says in the Bible, that, that came down and fed them during their wilderness wanderings. The, the, the time that Israel craved meat and God sent all this quail into their camp. You know, you hunters, it's, it's like, imagine, you know, every single buck in the world comes right into your tree stand. That's exactly what this, what, what this was like for them. Or the water from the rock, the number of times that he's provided. Think back when you're going through struggling times of the number of times that he's provided for you. When you were a young couple starting off, when you were raising your kids and not knowing what you were going to do, when you had, went through that period of unemployment and God provided for you anyway. Jonathan Rumi found those checks at just the right moment. That wasn't a coincidence. That was God continuing to provide at moments that he needed. And so all of this, all of these, these, um, these approaches for, for having hope for the future, the idea of, of being aware of the factors and, uh, that can cause you to lose hope, um, making sure that you're strong because God's with you, uh, reminding yourself of the provision, all of that is kind of in the here and now and also looking back. But, but we also need to look forward too, because that's what this verse of Haggai does. It's the fourth approach to having hope for your future, which is know and trust the glorious future awaiting you. Here's what uh, God says through Haggai in verse 9a. He says, The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Now, we know from biblical history that when that first temple was built, that same glory cloud that, uh, of God, the presence of God that accompanied the Israelites on, Israelites on their wilderness wanderings, that glory cloud descended powerfully upon that first temple. Biblical history tells us that no such glory cloud descended upon this second temple. But we do know that, that some 550 years after this occurrence, that Jesus Christ himself walked into that temple and began to teach the physical presence of God inside that temple. The glory of this temple being more important or being more powerful 
than the glory of the former temple. But this also points forward as well. This is also talking about Jesus' return, his second coming, when he establishes the new heavens and the new earth. As we see in Revelation, the need for a temple is no longer required, as it says in Revelation 21. It says, uh, John, inspired by this, John seeing this vision, I do not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And what's part of that future? For those of you who are discouraged, what's part of that future? For those of you who are feeling hopeless, part of that future is what God says will happen. Verses 3 and 4 of Revelation 21. Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. We get hints of that now through the Holy Spirit working inside of us. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things have passed away. That is your future. Winston Churchill said in his famous speech, never give in. Never, 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 never. In other words, always have hope. Always have hope. Knowing the factors that can cause you to lose it. Knowing that God is commanding you to be strong because he is with you in everything you're dealing with this week. Knowing that he has provided for you in the past and he's going to provide for you in the future. And knowing that you have a glorious future awaiting you. In other words, what God is telling you today is no matter what you're dealing with, you need to go back. You need to go back to your future. You need to go back to your future hope. To God be the glory. And pray with me, please. And so, Lord God, we thank you that, as you also said to Joshua, you will never abandon us or forsake us. For those who are feeling hopeless today, Lord, I pray that this message is an infusion of hope. For those who are lost today, Lord, watching online, perhaps even here, those who don't know you really, Jesus, as Savior, going through the motions, but don't really know you as Savior, Lord Jesus, I, I pray today that something in the music, all the emphasis on God being with you, something in this message today, Lord, Something in the hope found in you has caused that individual to be able to, to proclaim what we Christians know and what I say out loud on behalf of all of us. That you, Jesus, are God come down to earth. You are the temple that dwells within us. And that glory is greater than any of the temples that existed in ancient Israel. That, Lord, to, to be able to experience heaven one day the new heavens and the new earth. The Bible declares that I need to follow you. I need to believe in you. That you'll give forgiveness of sins. You'll cleanse me from all unrighteousness and that you will guide and direct me all the way, thanks to you, thanks to your sacrifice, to heaven one day. I can't begin to understand all of this right now, but uh, I know I do want to follow you and I know I believe in you, Lord Jesus. And so I declare that today. I declare that you are the magnificent God I declare that you are hope for my future. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand and sing.
a song to send you out with, with hope. My goodness gracious. And so have that hope today. Have the hope this week. Go in peace. Go in love. And walk and dance with Jesus today. And all God's people said, Amen.